Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Anchored in the Word Morning Reflection. And today we're going to continue our study in the book of James. If you have a Bible, I'd like to ask you to take it out and turn with me to James chapter 1. And we will be looking at verses 5 through 8 this morning. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and begin reading in verse number 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now this passage is extremely practical and we need to keep in mind that this passage is connected to the little section that we dealt with last, uh, last time we were together dealing with the concept of trials. And so let's begin with a summary statement and then dig into some of the details of this passage. Our summary statement for uh, James chapter 1, 5 to 8 is this. James wanted these suffering Christians to realize that the wisdom that they needed from God was available, and here's the key, if they were willing to pursue it. It's available if they want it. They need to go ahead and they need to pursue that wisdom. And so let's kind of keep that, uh, that concept in our minds as we deal with a couple of observations this morning. The first observation we have is this. Trials expose our need for wisdom. And when we come to that conclusion, we need to go to God to get this wisdom. When we go through trials, we are reminded that we need God to give us insight and practical wisdom. And so look at verse number five. He puts it this way. If any of you, meaning those who are going through trials, testing, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Now, when he says if, he's saying that in this sense, you know you need wisdom. In fact, the reason you know is because of what you're going through. As you go through trials and as you go through unsettling times, these are some of the ways that God helps us to realize that there are certain things in our perspective that need to be adjusted, they need to be fixed, they need to be changed. And so through those experiences, God reminds us we need perspective. And when he talks about wisdom, what exactly does he mean by that? Well, it really, wisdom involves a couple of different things. First of all, it involves the information that we need to make a good decision. I can't have wisdom without information. And in other words, there's a body of facts that are necessary for me to understand and me to process if I'm going to have wisdom. The skill to make the information, or th there's a second aspect to it. It's not just the information, but I have to be able to take that information with skill, and I have to appropriately apply that information. And then we need to look for wisdom, and we need to realize that when we talk about wisdom, we can find wisdom in a lot of different places. And we talk about wisdom, we need to realize that there are competing views on wisdom as well. In other words, there are some people whose lives and their wisdom is guided by a worldview that has God at the center, and there are others who have a worldview that doesn't factor God in. And so the way that they're going to approach situations and what we should or shouldn't do and how we should go about it, the information might be the same when it comes to circumstance, but the worldview being different is going to completely change how we approach dealing with that situation. So when we talk about wisdom, we need to recognize it's not just having information. It's not just having the skill to take that information and apply that information, but it also involves the worldview, how we relate to God and how we relate to his laws and what's most important values. Those are also factors into this concept of wisdom. A second observation we have is this. We need to go to God because he will give us the wisdom we need in abundance with a loving disposition. Notice the details of how he puts it in verse 5. He says that God gives to all men liberally. And that word liberally means he's generous. In other words, if I need wisdom, God is there with an abundance of resources saying, if you just ask, if you seek, I will give it, and I will give it in abundance. I'm going to give you everything that you need to be able to handle the situations that you're dealing with. 
A second thing that he says about the way that God gives in verse 5 is he abradeth not. The idea is that God doesn't mock us or he doesn't belittle us when we come to him for wisdom. You know, there are some people that they really do understand a certain field very well. They have a lot of knowledge. They have a lot of skill in that field. And if you were to go to them and say, I need some advice about such and such, they look at you like, you haven't figured that out? <laughs> and the reason they do that is because that wisdom that they have in that particular field is not accompanied with humility. It's not accompanied with love. And the truth is, God isn't like that. God loves people. God loves you and he loves me. And when we come to him with this heart saying, I need your wisdom, he says, I'm going to give it to you in abundance. I'm generously going to give it to you. And by the way, I love you and I care about you. In other words, God wants us to excel. He wants us to succeed in what we're doing. He's not going to belittle us in the midst of that. And I do want to add this, that when we're going through suffering, a lot of times our view of God can become twisted. And as it becomes twisted, we begin to look at God and say, I don't know if I want your wisdom because I'm not sure what you're going to say, or I don't know how you're going to relate to me when I seek your wisdom. And that kind of thinking, though it can happen in the midst of suffering, is something that James is saying, don't think that way. God is generous. God is not going to belittle you. He cares about you. And in verse 5, he also says, and he's going to give it to you. In other words, God promises that when his children come to him in time of need and say, God, I need your wisdom, he says, I'm going to give it to you. A third observation is this. We need to approach God with confidence in his character and with a heart that's willing to fully embrace his wisdom. Notice how he puts it in verse number six. He says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Now, what exactly does he mean, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering? On one side, we could look at this and say, well, well, he's basically saying that when you ask God for wisdom, believe that he's going to give it to you. And I think that that is a part of it. But as we continue in these verses, we're going to see that when he talks about asking in faith, nothing wavering, the idea is that you have a confidence that what he's going to give you is what's best. And you have a heart that's willing to commit fully to what God will show you. You're not going to take God's wisdom and kind of blend it into your own ideas and kind of get this consensus of opinions, competing views of how to handle a situation. And God's is a factor as opposed to God's is what I'm going to do. You'll see what, he, what I mean by that in just a second. In verse 6, he says, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. In other words, if we take... God's wisdom and the world's wisdom, two views of life that are in opposition, they're opposed to one another, we try to blend them together, we're going to have a big time problem. If, our, if we don't recognize that, that wisdom ultimately factors in not just practically how to deal with situations, but how to deal with situations with God in the picture or not in the picture, or with a certain moral ethic or a certain moral ethic not in the picture, or my best interest or the interest of others in the picture, or eternity versus the here and now. If we don't consider that those are factors into the wisdom that we're going to try to apply, then we're going to have trouble. We need to recognize that when we approach God for his wisdom, we need to be fully committed to doing it his way, to doing what he says is best and right. Observation four, trying to apply a blend of godly wisdom and worldly wisdom will unsettle our souls. We're going to be very unsettled. We won't have the stability that we need. We won't have the wisdom God desires to give us and is available to us if we try to pick and choose and blend together God's wisdom and the world's thinking on these issues. Notice how he puts it in verse six. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. I, I love to go fishing. And when I go fishing, I'm out on the water. And I like going fishing on days where the water's calm, <laughs> as opposed to when the wind is howling and driving and you can't cast your lure and you can't, you can't get your bait where you want it to go and the boat's getting pushed around. The truth is that fishing on a really windy day is miserable. Why is that? Because you're just being blown about by the wind. You're at the mercy of the elements. Basically, what he's saying is this. 
a person who's trying to take God's wisdom and he's trying to take the wisdom of this world, which is in complete opposition to God's wisdom, and is trying to blend those two things together, he's going to be at the, he's going to be at the whims of circumstance. He's going to be blown around. He's going to be driven by the wind. He's not going to have stability. Circumstances are going to push him as opposed to having stability that's rooted in truth in the midst of those difficulties. In other words, trying to blend these two forms of wisdom will leave us helplessly driven by circumstances. No stability. Number, verse number seven says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. In other words, he won't have God's wisdom because God's wisdom is exclusive. In other words, the moment that you begin to add into what God says and God's wisdom, the ideas that are in opposition to him, all of a sudden you don't have God's wisdom anymore. In other words, you have something that's been tainted. God's wisdom is exclusive. And so if we're not fully committed to doing things his way from his perspective, then we're going to be driven by the wind. And verse 80 says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. We'll be unstable in everything that we do because the Christian worldview is shaped by reality. What's shaped by reality is consistent. It's stable. Every other worldview that's not rooted in a biblical worldview is ultimately going to be inconsistent. It's going to have areas of consistency, but it can't be fully consistent because it's not factoring in certain elements that are absolutely necessary to have godly wisdom. And so the fact is that if I'm trying to make decision and I'm trying to navigate circumstance without God's wisdom, I'm not going to be stable. I'm going to be driven around by circumstances. I must be fully committed to doing things God's way from his perspective. So the question that we should ask this morning is how do we take these truths from James chapter 1 and just practically apply them? And so let me give you a couple of things that I jotted down today as I was thinking about it. The first is this. We constantly need to be growing in wisdom and allowing us that, that will allow us to pass through trials. And one of the things that God does is God allows us to go through trials so that we'll see that we need to grow in wisdom. And I think that's the first practical thing that we take away. When I'm going through difficulty, it's God's way of saying, I'm growing you. There's some things that you, you don't see this, the, the right way, and I have to reshape that in the way that you look at it. The second thing is this. We need to remember that God's wisdom is always available, but we need to have a heart for it, and we need to pursue it. The reason that we don't have God's wisdom in circumstances is it's not because it isn't available. It's because either one, we're unwilling to ask and seek it, or two, when we ask and seek it, we really want to take it and blend it to something that's already there, as opposed to just accepting what he says is true. A third thing is this, we need to look at God correctly when we're struggling because the pressures that we're experiencing can distort our view of him. When we're going through difficulties, we can begin to stop seeing God as he is and start seeing him through the lens of our circumstance. And you know, one of the things that's so helpful about other people coming alongside of us when we're, when we're pressured is they're not feeling the same emotions that we're feeling. There are factors that we become blinded to. They can still see them clearly because they're not dealing with the same circumstances that we're dealing with. But we have to realize that when we go through pressure, our view of God can become distorted. And James directly addresses that in this section. And lastly, we need to resist the temptation to try to blend godly wisdom with this world's wisdom. Because the result of this attempt to blend these two different approaches to life that are in complete opposition, it will leave us helpless and unstable. I hope that these, these uh, truths that we've looked at this morning will be a blessing to you and encouragement. And uh, let's bow together for a word of prayer. And it's been good to see some of you this morning. Let's pray. Father, help us to take these truths from the book of James. Help us to internalize them. Help us to embrace them. Father, help us to see you clearly in the midst of our trials. Father, help us to resist the temptation to take godly wisdom and try to blend it and harmonize it with a wisdom that doesn't factor in who you are and how you work and what's most important, and what's right, and what's wrong. 
Father, help us to be people who are fully committed to doing things in a godly manner. Help us to see who you are clearly and help us to live in the light of these truths. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been good to see some of you this morning. I hope that you have uh, a wonderful day. And uh, if you uh, appreciate this, I hope that you'll leave a comment, uh, like it, share it. And I hope that this will be a blessing to you and those who, uh, who come across this later in the day. Have a great day now. Bye.